love to thank the Honors College for asking me to speak. It is such an honor to be able to not only speak to you, but to speak to you about my favorite thing, which is race. So I'm so excited to talk to you today. The first thing I want to do is, because it's Martin Luther King Day and he is my personal hero, I'm going to kind of connect some of the things I talk about today to Martin Luther King. So my first uh, quote, which is, I have a couple of quotes that are my favorite. But the time is always right to do what's right. When is the time right to improve race relations in the United States? Now, all the time. And so when I reflect on this quote, I think about it and I go, why are we wasting so much time? Why aren't we discussing race, talking about race, and making things better? It's important to do that. So today what I'm going to do is have a frank and honest conversation with you about race. You have to know I feel more comfortable talking about race than anything else. And so for some people it makes it uncomfortable. But for me, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of what I do in my interracial class. I'm much deeper, I have some of my students here today. <laughs> I'm much deeper in my interracial class, but I have an hour to try to tell you what we can do to improve race relations, not only on campus, but in our communities and in the workplace. There are certain things we can do that are simple, but take commitment. And you have to be able to wanna to honor that commitment. You can't say, well, I'm gonna do race relations today, and I'm gonna do it tomorrow. It has to be ingrained and it has to become a habit, and it's something that you have to do every day. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you about my life well lived. My journey, or my academic journey, has been interesting. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I went to McDowell Elementary. I also went to Bovian Middle School, and I graduated from Cass Technical High School. I have experienced racism, discrimination, and prejudice my entire life. And unfortunately, I will probably experience racism, prejudice, discrimination for the rest of my life. And so that's why I'm so passionate about what I do, is because I do not want my children to experience the things that I have experienced. I want them to have a better life. And so every day I go into the classroom with them in mind, because I know what it's like, and I never want them to experience that. So when I was small, my parents taught me about race. I learned about race at a very, very young age. My parents taught me about race as a survival tool. People go, survival tool? Yes, because when I was young, my parents told me people are not going to like you. 
And I was like, well, why? <laughs> why aren't they going to like me? And they said, simply because of the color of your skin, which is sad. And I said, well, you, I'm, I'm going to be smart, thinking it would be great. And they're not going to like me for something I cannot change? And my parents said, yes, and we need to prepare you for that. So my parents did several things to prepare me as a child so that I would grow up to be a strong, confident woman, which was very important for me. So I'm going to share a few stories. Uh, one story is about my dad. And one of the things he did, he was just an amazing person. But when he was young, I guess he was a teenager, he led his first boycott. I'm thinking, teenager, how'd you do that? <laughs> he grew up in Evansville, Indiana. And in Evansville, Indiana, they would not let blacks swim at the swimming pool. So he decided to lead a march and a boycott. He said, if we can't swim, then nobody should be able to swim. He led the march and was successful. They closed the pool down. And then they let everybody in. But what is so important about his story, my dad couldn't even swim. <laughs> Good as well. And it was so important because when you see injustice, you stand up. When you see something is wrong, even, th even though it doesn't affect you, you have to stand up for it. And so at an early age, I learned injustice cannot stand, and I must do something. And so being able to teach race is my way of fighting injustice. Uh, those things that I learned as a young child caused me to do other things in my life. It helped me pursue my PhD and my teaching accomplishments. And I am lucky. Everybody's not as lucky as me, and I have to be honest with that. I happen to work with amazing people. I work with colleagues who accept me for my accomplishments and not my race, and that's beautiful. They have what I call, I'm homegrown. <laughs> I did my uh, bachelor's degree in communication, I did my master's, and then I came back and I stayed. So I've actually really been at EMU for over 29 years. I loved it so much I stayed. And it was because I had colleagues and I had teachers who accepted me for who I was, which is so important. And so all these things, which I am lucky, not everybody has that experience. I am very grateful for. And that, again, makes me say, I know it's possible. So when I hear all this negativity, I have to stop it because I know that there are so many positive, wonderful things out there. My personal journey for my goals and race relations, it's a difficult journey. But I intend to stay with it as long as I can because I know I can make a difference. I make a difference in my classrooms. By the end of the semesters, my students who never talk to each other of different races, different ethnicities, are having conversations. So I know I'm making an impact. And I just decided a long time ago, when I first told people, I'm going to change the world, they were like, OK. I was like, I know it's hard, but the hard things are the things that I like. I love them. And so I'm going to do it one person at a time. The problem is. I can't do it by myself. I need your help. I wish I could just have that magical thing that could change it and make things different, but I don't possess that. So what I do in my interracial class is I give you the skills, and those particular skills help change you and help you communicate better with people who do not look like you. And that's what I intend to do. So I, can't, I don't have a magic pill. Don't have <laughs> but I need people to help me make the world better. And I believe one person can change and have an impact, but I also know I need other people to help collaborate with me. There's one thing I do before I talk about race, because race is heavy. <laughs> and people go, you talk about this difficult topic and then you smile, and I go, I know. <laughs> and it's because I'm passionate about it. But there's one thing I like to do when I talk about race, and I'm gonna have you do it and take a few minutes to do that. I like to define respect. So before we talk about race, I have to get respect out of the way. 
That way, it doesn't ensure that the conversation is going to be great, but it ensures that we take it to another level. So what I'd like you to do is turn to the person sitting next to you, say hello. <laughs> and I'd like you to take a few minutes and define respect with that person. After you define respect, I want you to describe how it feels when other persons respect you. And then tell me how it feels when a person disrespects you. And then we're going to talk. So take a minute to answer those questions. OK, I'm going to pull you back. I'm going to pull you back here for a minute. So what, what was your definition of respect? Don't get quiet. You were just talking. What is that? OK, somebody else. What's your other definition of respect? Valuing another person's opinions or beliefs oh. as much as your own. OK, anybody else? I see. I'm like a light. Go ahead. Caring about another person. Caring about another person. OK, so how does it feel when somebody respects you? Good? You good? Empowered. <laughs> Empowered. OK, all right. Now, I always ask, would you want someone to respect you or like you? Me too. Mm, they, when they like you, they treat you okay. But when they respect you, they kind of heighten it up. <laughs> All right? So how does it feel when someone disrespects you? Sad? Ad what'd you say again? Agitated. Agitated. Ooh, Olivia, that was a big word. <laughs> Agitated. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Go ahead. Like you think that you're less than them? You think that they're less than them. Okay. Go ahead. So you just want to go right back and disrespect them too. And then it heightens it up and everything else happens. OK, all right, all right, all right. So I asked you to define respect. Tell me how it feels to be respected. And then tell me how it feels to be disrespected. If we know all these things, how come we don't respect people all of the time? We know it. How come we don't? Of ignorance. That is my child. <laughs> that, is, that is my child. Yes. Oh, um, because it's easier to yeah. not be respectful. Yeah. Than it is to seek within them something that you find respectful. Okay. Do you think we're a little bit lazy? Oh. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. I think that sometimes peer pressure can have a lot to do with it too. Hmm. Trying to fit in. <clears throat> Everybody else is doing it. Why not do it too? Right. Okay. All right. So go ahead. I think respect takes empathy. Mm. And so if you're talking, especially with someone that you've never talked to before, in order to respect them, you yourself have to hold empathy with what they're saying. Okay. Okay. All right. So I always give this charge in my class that after I talk about respect, I make them go respect people for 30 days. So I'm going to give you that charge as well. Because they say if you do something for 30 days, it becomes a habit. And it not, will not only improve communication, not all the time, but it will make the situation a little bit better. Because if you come from an area of respect, you treat people differently. Okay. So let's talk about campuses. Eastern is what I call a rare institution in which we do have issues, but we're also doing some progressive things that other colleges are not doing. We just celebrated Martin Luther King Day. There are things that we are doing in our classes. Some universities do not have diverse courses. We offer courses in US diversity and global awareness, but there's still some issues. And so I want to kind of talk about some of these issues so we can stop them. It's time. So on college campuses, the first thing that I always hear students say, well, I don't know who they are. Fear level. What did your parents tell you about strangers? Don't talk to them. So we don't. Even though we're adults, pre-adults, <laughs> that we still have that ingrained in us, that we don't talk to people who are different from ourselves. I'm telling you to talk to people who are different from yourself. Move beyond your comfort zone and find someone that you have something in common with. This is only a piece of who you are. It is not everything. 
And so you have to understand that even though somebody looks like you, you may have commonalities. You may have shared so many things in common, but because you're allowing the color of your skin to stop you, you never are able to engage. You stop it right there. Uh, miscommunication. We'll start to communicate with people, and then once it goes wrong, we stop. Then what happens is we stop our listening skills. And if anybody says anything that's different from what we think or we feel, we shut down. But if you shut down, how can you ever learn about somebody else? Race relations requires commitment and hanging in there when it gets tough. And sometimes it gets tough, but you still have to hang in there regardless. Racial stereotypes, sometimes we allow those stereotypes to become the barriers. Walter Lippmann coined the term stereotypes, and he says they're pictures in our head. And what happens is that as soon as we see someone and we have a stereotype of them, it immediately pops up in our head. And that becomes a barrier of why we stop communicating with people who are different from ourselves. So we allow those things to stop us when we can actually communicate effectively. Microaggressions are interesting. <laughs> they are what I call little insults. And if you've heard a lot of them, they begin to irritate you. Some people will say, and I guess the most irritating one for me is, you're so articulate for a black person. And I go, what does that mean? <laughs> and I go, but you're so articulate. Or where do you live? As if I don't live in a house or a place. So those constant insults, even though they're unaware of them and unaware that they're saying it, for the person that's receiving it, it becomes harsh and sometimes expected. When students of color are experiencing racism and they want you to listen, please listen. They are being truthful. And you may go, well, how do you know? Because I was one of them. So when my students talk to me about racism discrimination, there's a part of me that aches because I was that student and I was the one experiencing the same thing as they did. So we have to move beyond this. It's time. Anger, easiest emotion in the world. It's easy to be angry. It's hard to love and it's hard to forgive. So go beyond angry, unless you're gonna do something about anger and make a move or a change or make something better. But don't use anger to stop you. Use anger to move you. That's what you need to do. So even though people think or consider it to be a negative emotion, use it in a positive way. It doesn't have to stop you. People get angry all the time. A student in class the other day and he was angry and I said, didn't I tell you on the first day? He said, yeah, you did, Dr. Fields. And I said, now we're both gonna process it <laughs> and then we're gonna move on. Because if you stay in that anger, what happens is you displace it on somebody else that didn't even deserve it. You're so angry over here about what happened three or four days ago, somebody else starts talking to you, irritates you, and you dump it on them. They didn't have anything to do with it, but that's what you do. It's a displacement. So take your anger and use it in a positive way, not a negative. Racial intimidation, stop it. There should be no threats against other students, verbal or nonverbal. There should be no way that on a college campus, our focus is education. You should not be intimidating your classmates. And I say your classmates because I believe we are a community. So you need to stop all of the intimidation, the threats. Stop harming people who are on the same path and journey as yourself. We're all here to get an education. That should be our focus not tearing people down because they look different from yourself. Lack of respect, I had you do the respect because a lot of times I think most of our issues, because we don't know each other and because of lack of respect. So we don't respect people so that we don't teach, uh, treat them with dignity or grace. And a lot of us have limited contact with people who don't look like us. How many of you went to a high school where the high school was predominantly your race? I did. And when you came to Eastern, that was kind of your first experience with different cultures? Yeah, me too. 
<laughs> and so you have to adjust. But when I got here, I was like, instead of going, oh, I'm fearful, I was like, wow, this is great. <laughs> this is amazing. I get to know new people, some people who are on the same path as myself. So don't limit yourself because you're not having contact with people that look like you. You may share more in common with people who don't look like you than people you do. And then I have what you can't see, sorry about that, barriers to developing interracial friendships. Develop interracial friendships. My interracial friendships have changed my life. I also call my best friend, uh, Erica, my diversity checker. I do, because when my kids were small, I would go, hey, I gotta talk about something. It's race related, how do I say it? Make sure I'm not being over dramatic, you know? And she would come back to me, and we talk about race. And I feel so comfortable with her talking about race, and she's not even inside of my race, she's opposite. But her friendship changed my life. And so interact with people who do not look like yourself. Oh, that's social media. I have a love-hate relationship with the social media. <laughs> sometimes I love it. It gives me information. It's great. But then sometimes I hate it. So I'm trying to decide where I'm standing today. Today is okay, I haven't been on it today. <laughs> so that may be a reason why I'm loving it. But one of the things that disturbs me about social media is keyboard courage. That people will post things that are negative, nasty, and mean, and they would never do it face to face. But behind a computer, they feel that freedom and I'm saying, stop. Who asked you to put negativity into the atmosphere? Why are you doing that? Why not be positive? You don't have to tell the whole world what you are doing. Keep a little bit to yourself. <laughs> you know, it, and most of the time, if you put a post out there and you're angry, an hour later you're like, oh, I shouldn't have did that when I was angry. Now everybody knows how I feel. So I'm saying, instead of being nasty and mean, be nice and kind. Takes the same effort, you feel a little bit better afterwards. <laughs> so make sure you don't get into that habit of the keyboard. So as I talk about EMU and your students, my one question I have for you is, what kind of world do you want to live in? What kind of world do you want to live in? because you are my future. And I need to know if we're in the same place. So where do you want to, what kind of world do you want to live in? Anybody can answer it for me. They say teachers should wait like a minute or two. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Hello. And that's important. Thank you. I saw the point. I don't, that was kind of hip. I don't know how to respond to the <laughs> hipness. He did this to me, and I was okay. I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I feel compelled to do something. <laughs> But I was like, I don't want to be too nerdy with my stuff. So I just felt compelled to, do, to respond to you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, that is my child. <laughs> Love my kids. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the community. And I think of EMU as my community. And I spend, my family is here, a lot of time here because I love it here. So <laughs> I give a lot. But my first thing is build friendships with people within your community. When I was growing up, we used to know everybody on the block. Everybody's mother knew what you were doing, and if you weren't doing what you were doing, they were telling. 
They were knocking on your door. <laughs> you know, your daughter was down the street or your son was down the street doing this. So it was like a community. Everybody knew everybody and everybody was watching out for you. Everybody was supporting you and taking care of you. Unfortunately, I don't see that anymore. I think because we're so engaged with our own lives, and I'm guilty. I work so much, by the time I come home, I'm taking care of my kids, my family, my husband. I really don't have time to socialize. So I do my best, but I don't do it as much. And then over the years, we've lived in our house for 18, 19 years, and people move. So when your friends that you had stayed there and they moved, because in my neighborhood, everybody stayed for 20, 30 years. Now they're moving back and forth, it kind of got hard to make those connections. So I promised myself that I'm going to try to do a little bit better to make sure I have an impact on my community. Participate in diverse events. Go to the DIA, Charles Wright Museum. Go to the Holocaust Museum. Go to places that you normally wouldn't go. I went to the DIA over break and it was just so amazing that I saw so many people of so many different colors just interacting with each other. And it felt absolutely amazing. So embrace yourself in the community and participate. I live in Romulus and we have the pumpkin festival. <laughs> and so I try to go, when the kids were younger, I, that was a bigger effort, but I try to engage myself and do things and participate because it's important to get to know your community. Service, please volunteer. I am a service oriented person. I learned that from my parents. They taught me to believe that service is a price you pay for living on this earth. That is who I am. I give any time that I can. My problem at work is saying no. I'm working on that. <laughs> but I say yes because I know somebody needs help. And so anytime I can give, I try to make sure that I can give. Things that are close to campus, Park Ridge Community. The diva, I didn't fall. <laughs> I mean, Park Ridge Community Service uh, Center, somewhere you can volunteer. Boys and Girls Club, volunteer. If you have old clothes that you know you haven't worn in years, donate them to the Salvation Army so somebody else can have some clothes, especially in the wintertime when it's cold. So these are small things that you can do to help your community. Find out what your community needs and then give them what they need. <clears throat> and make a commitment to service. Again, service is my core. I believe that serving others is the most important thing. And my dad passed a year and a half ago, and he died on his way to the Park Ridge Community Center. He was doing service. And he passed out halfway there and he sat on the board he sat on tons of boards and did everything and he was retired he would get up in the morning and say i got to do this i got to do that i would say dad just take a break no can't stop got to make sure people need help i got to be a voice for those who don't have a voice and so make that commitment to service it's really really important in your workplace um it's important to be color brave. One of my colleagues uh, sent me a TED talk, uh, Carrie Madison, and I fell in love with this TED talk. <laughs> it was by Melanie Hobson, who is George Lucas's wife. And in the talk, she talks about being color brave. And being color brave is when you see a person of color and the most qualified candidate as the same person. So many times we look at a person of color and say, well, they're not qualified, can't hire them. And we make all these stereotypes about what they're gonna do, who they're gonna be, instead of saying the most qualified person and being a person of color can be the same. Race and gender are not qualifiers for a job, but if there's someone who is 
and they, everything you need, education, enthusiasm, potential, then you hire them and you be color brave. Stop putting limitations on other people because you have stereotypes or you have biases. Bless you. <laughs> because my job and the people that hired me were color brave. That they looked at me and they said, you can do it. You're getting your PhD, you can teach, you love being in the classroom. This is what you can do. And because they believed in me and they were color brave, I am here today. So you have to be color brave in the workplace. It's so important. Do not, do not, do not, do not tolerate hateful messages. Do not tolerate racial jokes in your workplace. They are inappropriate and they're damaging to the morale of your employees. Do not use any type of inappropriate racial comments. And if you hear a coworker saying something, stop them. Because if you don't let them know that what they're doing is inappropriate, they will continue to do it. So you have to say, this is not appropriate in my workplace. And I laugh because most of the time I come to work, that's where I get my peace. <laughs> I'm working so hard I get, when I'm at home that when I come to work, it's actually, I'm like, because I love what I do, it's actually easy for me. So you don't want anything like that to come from your coworkers, your staff, or your students. And I always tell my students appropriate language in my classroom, especially because I teach race. And because I teach race, I have to have this comfortable climate where people feel comfortable. Because if they don't feel comfortable, they're not gonna talk to me. And they're not gonna shift and they're not gonna move. So I need them to feel comfortable with me. So in my syllabus, I have no inappropriate language. No inappropriate behavior. I don't stand for it and I think it's inappropriate. And it should not be in a learning environment. Acknowledge the inappropriate behavior and make small changes. What happens a lot of times is we get overwhelmed by these big things and goals we're gonna do, and then it never gets done. My small change is to teach interracial, interethnic communication. It is my life well lived. It is how I make a difference and make an impact on the world. So make small changes. Those small changes will add up and end up being large changes but you have to make some changes. Have a commitment to diversity. And having a commitment to diversity doesn't mean you talk diversity. It means you display it. That some people will say, well, yes, I am, and then they never show it. You have to have a commitment to treating people who are different from yourselves just like you want to be treated, the respect. It's so important to do that and have that commitment to that, which really makes a difference. Diversity training is critical. And in my class, interracial interethnic communication, the last assignment that they have to do in the class is diversity training. There have been a lot of issues in the news lately, because I always keep up with the current events, with police officers and people of color. And you would be surprised to find out that a lot of police officers have never had diversity training. If you're going to work in a community that looks different from yourself, you need to be trained in how to interact with that community. And if you don't have that, mistakes will be made. Diversity training is critical. It is so important to have that. On faculty, on campuses, I always talk about faculty, which is really important to me, because the student population is growing, and it's becoming tremendously diverse. But the faculty is not, and there are several reasons for that. One, faculty hire faculty. So they have to be color brave. Faculty have to reach out and pick the best and not be fearful of change. 
So what happens a lot of times is we're so fearful of change that we don't go that step further because we want to stay right in that comfort zone because the comfort zone feels good. So the diversity, diversity training can shift you and make you understand all populations. If you are a store owner and your people that come inside of your store are from all different races, shouldn't you have people that reflect the customers that come into your store? Yes. Because when people see people who look like them, they'll shop more. They'll shop more. They'll go, wow, this feels great. <laughs> because they see a reflection of themselves. So you have to have that diversity training. And so one of the things I make my students do is diversity training. And it really makes a difference because they begin to understand the importance of training and talking about race and not being fearful of it. So it's so important. You also have to have inclusion. I often talk about one of the things with race is that I can't do it by myself and I also can't sit at the table by myself. If we're gonna talk about making some real changes on race relations, I need every person of race to sit at the table with me. If I'm just making decisions based on the few people I have here, I may not make good decisions. So when we talk about race relations, I need everybody at the table with me. So we can collectively say, hey, how can we make this better? Because that's really the purpose is to improve race relations. How could I make it better? So you need to have everybody sitting at the table, everybody talking and everybody discussing. Have you heard about the, I talked about this in class today, the controversy over the Oscars? You're like, yeah. <laughs> and I said, everybody's not sitting at the table. Uh, the Washington Post did a study Last year, because they said the Oscars organization is kind of sneaky, or, or I shouldn't say sneaky, apologize, very closed, and you don't know. <laughs> but out of the membership, 94% are white, 2% are black, and quote me, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, 77 or 76 are male. And the average age of the voters is 63. So someone who is older may not have the same vision as someone who is younger when they're deciding. And then one student told me today in my honors class, I'm trying to see if he's here today. He was so great. Mitchell, is Mitchell here? No. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, is Mitchell here? <laughs> Thanks, Mitchell. He said about 20, 20 to 50, pick the movies that we see. So if you ever wonder, because sometimes I go, what kind of movie was that? I didn't see that. <laughs> it's because somebody else is picking it, but who's picking it? Who's sitting at the table? So you need to have everybody sitting at the table when decisions are made. It needs to be inclusive. Everybody needs to be there so that you make sure you're being fair to everyone. So improving race relations takes effort. You really have to have effort. If you don't want to do it, you're having some reservations about doing it, it's not going to happen. You really need to make sure that there is effort. The effort you take to get on that social media every day, because I know you're really connected. Make that effort to treat somebody right. It's just small. But if you do it consistently, it becomes a habit. And you're always treating people right. Motivation. You got to have the desire. You have to have the desire to want to make things better. It's time for us to stop talking about what we're going to do and actually demonstrate what we can do. How we can make a difference is so important. And change your mindset. Get to know people who are different from yourselves and stop putting yourself in this itty bitty box. The box does not exist. Step out of it 
and change how you feel about people who do not look like yourself. As I mentioned earlier, my life well lived is teaching interracial, interethnic communication. It brings me more joy than anything else in this world. On the first day of class, they always laugh at me because I'll come in and I'll say good morning and they don't say anything. I walk back out. I go, they didn't hear me. I go, walk. <laughs> I took all this effort to get here and they didn't say hello to me. <laughs> and I come back in and I'm like, hello. And I set the tone. I set the tone because I have a goal in mind that my students don't know. That by the end of the semester, we will become a community that they're gonna see each other after the semester is gone on campus and go, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Cause we have become this close. I do things in that class that take you to a different place and that you'll carry those things with you for the rest of your life. That the things that I teach in this particular class, you will carry with you on campus. You will carry with you in the community and you will carry with you in the workplace. You will look at people differently and you'll stop being negative and you'll look at people and treat people with respect and honor and grace, just the way you want to be treated. This class changed my life because I knew I had a purpose. I just didn't know how to get it out. I wasn't sure what I needed to do. And then once I realized this was my purpose, this was my life well lived, that this is how I can help people change and move because I have particular goals in my life. And one of the things my dad would always tell me is you want your children to have a better life than you. That is my goal and so that my children can have a better life than me. 20, 20, 30 years ago, I mean 20, 30 years from now, I don't wanna have to still be talking about race. And if I do, I may be an angry old woman. <laughs> I hope not, but I'm like, hmm, stop, we're still here. And so I don't wanna have to be there. I want to be able to say the things that I did made a difference and I did it one person at a time. So for me, teaching race, talking about race is my comfort zone. I get more excited, which people don't understand. I get more excited about talking about race than anything else. When I was first in here, she was just laughing at me. I was just so, ex I couldn't contain myself, could I? <laughs> And I even had to change my shoes because I thought I'm going to be moving. I'm so excited. I got to just move around. <laughs> but it's everything to me. And by the time students leave my class, they're just different. So for me, teaching race is my life well lived. I do have a final statement, but I'm going to do something that I do in class. And I'm going to, you're like, no, yes. <laughs> I'm going to have all of you stand. Can you stand for me? Keep your personal belongings with you, just so you. So what I want you to do is find somebody who looks a little bit different from you. It could be hair color, it could be clothes, it could be male, female, but find somebody who's different from you. Anybody you want. Blair, go over to Pat. Pat's right there, that's my husband. Blair. This is Pat. <laughs> okay. Oh, I should talk on here. Okay. Okay. I had, you're so lively, I had to get the mic. <laughs> so what I want you to do is I want you to talk until you find something in common. And once you do, just kind of raise your hand so I can see you. But I want you to talk until you find something in common. It could be a movie, it could be clothes, whatever. Find something in common with that person. Now what I need you to do is I need you to expand your circle. Add more people, find more things in common. 
I need you to, to shift one more time. I need you to get a little bit bigger. I need you to find some more people, get a little bit bigger. <laughs> a little bit bigger. Okay. You can have a seat for me. I was going to make you even bigger, but I don't know if that would work. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? Talking to people you never talked to before? So what were some things you had in common that you were like, didn't know you had? Well, I talked to your husband. Oh, Lord. What did he say? And we decided what we have in common is we both love you. Oh. I told him we were going to fight. Okay. <laughs> good. You're well taken. Okay. We both love you. Okay, good. All right. Somebody else. What did you have in common? Talk about food. What was your, did you have a favorite food? Did you get to that? All different things. Okay. Somebody else. We didn't know we went to the same high school. Get out. See what the smaller thing. <laughs> and you went to the same high school. Oh my gosh. Anybody else? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Is any Is any Will Smith? Is that no, That wasn't a real cuz that was like, yeah. When you like Will Smith, you're like, "Hi, there's a high enthusiasm." Okay. Anything else that you had in common? We all plan on going to grad school. You all plan on going to grad school? Okay. And the reason why I do this activity it's because so many times we focus on the things that we don't have in common, and they're really small. If we look and start talking to people, we find out we have tons of things in common. It doesn't have to start with this large leap, but if you start with small things, then they can expand to big things. So start interacting with people who do not look like yourself. It's a beautiful journey. It's a wonderful experience. And you can change the world. You is what researchers say will make the difference in race relations. It will not be me. I can do what I can. But they say that the youth will change everything and that our population is shifting. The census goes back and forth with the statistics by, by 2042 to 2050. Latinos will be the majority race in this country. We will have a racial shift. They even say that our children now are even more diverse than they've ever been. So we have to make some changes and some decisions on how we're going to treat people in the future. I am so optimistic that I believe it's going to happen. And people go, I don't think so. And I go, no, I believe it in here. Because people I talk to and people I touch, I know I make a difference. When people come to my office, I feel confident that they're not coming to look and see what kind of race I am. They're coming because I extend myself, that I give my all to students. And your success is my success. So when you interact with people who are different from yourselves, that means I did my job. And I'm really excited about doing my job and doing it well. <laughs> That's important to me. As I finish and I close, and I'm going to let you ask me questions if you have any questions. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes by Martin Luther King. And since we celebrated his day yesterday, I was on campus and I participated. I'm also on the MLK planning committee, which is very important to me, that I had to end with one of my favorite quotes. That I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. I have that same dream. That when you look at my children, and please stand up, my lovelies. <laughs> that you judge them by their character. And you do not judge them by the color of their skin. They are beautiful, they are bright, and magnificent. That's just a mama talking. <laughs> you can have a seat. <laughs> but I want you to look at them for who they are 
and not make a judgment on them for something that they can, can't control. And so I think it's time that we actually live his dream, that we treat people with the respect that they deserve and treat them as human beings and that we take it a little bit further and give them the respect. It makes a difference. I hope that my students in my class are here. I'm so excited, but <laughs> I hope that you'll get a chance to take me for interracial. I'm kind of plugging my class. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm putting it in there. <laughs> and I think it's a magnificent class, and it's an honor to be able to teach this particular class. My mentor, Dr. James Robinson, developed this class, and it was actually an honor uh, when I had the opportunity to teach this class. I've been teaching this class, I think my numbers are getting fuzzy, but I think going on 16 years, and I love it. I absolutely love it. I get excited on the first day. It's the best thing that has ever happened to me. So if you get a chance to take the class with me, you learn a little bit more. But I thought I'd give you a taste of what I do and how my life well lived is talking about race. Do you have any questions for me? Go ahead. Was your class yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I teach an honors class. Um, Becky has been so kind to me. I usually ask to request it every semester. So it's a good thing. <laughs> so I do teach an honors class every semester, and then I have um, a regular course as well. So I usually teach three. Right now I'm teaching three. I, I may uh, go down to two. Any other questions? And I'm like this. You can ask my students. Am I like this all the time in class? Rich is like, yeah. <laughs> and he has me at 930. So can you imagine what I'm like in the morning? I know, my husband says I'm the only person he knows that likes to get up and is early and bright. I get up at five. Okay, tell everything, Olivia. Just, uh... Okay, <laughs> any other questions? I can't see. Okay, I'm sorry, the light. Uh, just kind of playing off that and uh, growing in, uh, in the race. Uh, is there another milestone for you? Is it a book, an annual I, I just finished doing a conference at NCA in uh, Vegas. Uh, I am currently in the process of writing a paper about uh, my experience as an African-American professor teaching race and how my students react to me. Uh, I would like to teach a book. I mean, let's teach a book. I'm so excited. I would, like to, <laughs> I would like to write a book sometime in the future, but I think that if I wrote a book knowing me, it would be a student collaborated book. That I would like to have students' voices so they could uh, tell how they feel or maybe even articles or something like that. I would love to collaborate with some students. So I hope so. You're welcome. Any other? I can't see. Oh, I'm like. <laughs> um, you got a mic. <laughs> what advice can you offer for pointing out microaggressions to people that um, don't believe in them or challenge them? My first suggestion would just be think about what you say. Think about what you say. Because your intent is not to, because it's not the intent. You don't mean to insult, but you end up insulting. So think about what you say before you say it. The problem with communication is once you say it, you can't take it back. That's the problem. And even though you say, I'm sorry, people still here remember what you say. And one of the things I talk about in my class is racism, prejudice, and discrimination are not physical. They're mental. They are, too. Oh, she is just working me today. <laughs> yes, they are, too. But they're mental. They're here. And they're here. And we are not born racist, discriminatory, or prejudiced. We learn it. And I always believe if we learn it, we can dismantle it. But we have to take that effort. So just think about what you say. I think that's the most important thing. I think sometimes we communicate without processing the consequences of how we communicate, that we don't intend to be harmful. And I think that is important for people to know, is that sometimes we do have really good intentions, but our communication skills are poor. And it doesn't come out the way and we end up hurting people because we're not skilled at communicating. Go ahead. So I have a question. 
Ask me. <laughs> I'll say something to you like if I'm interested in knowing where your home is. Yeah. And I say to you, you said earlier, yeah. you know, when people would say things like, um, where do you live? That you might have interpreted that, like, what do you mean where do I live? I live in a house. But that wasn't what my question was. Yeah. But if I say something like that, and I, act, I didn't mean to say something that was insulting, how do we handle that, that communication <laughs> so that it stops being something that hurt on one side and not intended on the other? And, uh, one thing I would say is instead of saying, where do you live? What's your hometown? Where'd you grow up? Tell me about it. So just switch it a little bit so it doesn't seem as if, hmm, where do you live? You know, and so you're, you're really going, where'd you grow up? I'm so excited, I wanna know. And so you just switch your communication just a little bit. You tweak it because your interest is really getting to know a person. So I'm older now, so when I hear microaggressions, I go, hey, hey, stop that. <laughs> But my bossiness comes out. <laughs> but everybody is not like me. So what happens is if you say it, people internally make it affect you. But because I know and I understand your intent was not bad, you just didn't know how to communicate. So just switch it up so that you're asking as if you're interested. Did that help a little bit? That does. And the thing that makes the most difference is that you know, sometimes we say and do things that we honestly just don't like. No. Do but it's so important for the person who receives that to be able to say, oh, whoa, 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 you know, right. can you rephrase that? Help yes. Us, help us to understand, because I think a lot of the times, a lot of times that we, we sometimes just don't know the impact. Yes. We don't, we don't. And I'd feel free to contact me and call me if you want to talk about race. I love talking about race. <laughs> and I feel comfortable with it. So if you have additional questions you think about after class, um, just contact me and we can talk and we can sit down or take my class. <laughs> that would be helpful. Thank you so much. I was so honored. Thank you.